right, so welcome to my Ordinary Angels podcast. I'm very excited. This is my second Ordinary Angels interview right here in Tamworth at the 2019 Country Music Festival. It is an ideal opportunity to catch up with people from all over Australia, all in the one place for 10 days. And uh, my second guest for this year is none other than the beautiful Lynn Botel. <laughs> So good to be here. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Me. And as you can hear, we have a lovely studio audience here today. Well, we hope they're lovely. We might decide that at the end yeah. of the day. <laughs> but uh, I, I am so grateful to have you all here. Thank you so much for coming and being part of this very special event. Ordinary Angels is about ordinary people doing extraordinary things. It's not about the people who have got it all together necessarily. It's about those of us who are living life on the roller coaster and uh, about encouraging other people to have some hope. So, Lynn, you and I go back a ways, mm. which is lovely. Yeah. You currently, I'm just going to give a little bit of a career spiel and then I'll hand okay. it over to you to, to fill in the gaps. But you have done six albums in various iterations. Yeah. Lynn Botel, Bella, yep. and currently BBU yes. as well, which is Bennett, Botel and Urquhart. That's right. Six albums over your career. You were star maker in 1997. Yeah, that's gone fast. <laughs> I have to tell you, the first time Dave and I were considering coming into country music because we were doing covers bands and corporate scene, we were playing for some reason in Warrigal. Yeah. And so were you apparently the week after us at the same venue and there was your poster and I remember thinking right back then, didn't know you, didn't really know much about country music, going, oh she looks lovely, I'd like to get to know her and here we are. 20 odd years later. Was it that great big pink poster? I had uh, about 2,000 of those oh, printed. You had really larger hair than oh, you have these hair, days. The <laughs> hair photo, yes. Very appropriate for 1997. Yes, it was the right. permed, yeah. the permed hair days. Gorgeous. Yeah. Gorgeous. And uh, yes. you are currently the director of the Academy of Country Music, and you and I have shared. Uh, times at the Academy together yeah. over the years. I think at one stage I might have been your boss, but if I ever come back now, you're going to be mine? Yes, yeah, something like that. Wonderful. Yes, yes. Fantastic. And do you have an ongoing live music career as well as all of these yeah. things that you're doing? Yeah. So it, it's all these years of career, 20-odd, probably more than that because Star Maker was a little bit into your career. You are obviously quite young then. You must have been three Yes, I was three then, right. yes. Um, I first started coming to Tamworth when I was 13 and um, it was through our country music club right? in Toowoomba. I was in two clubs, one in Dolby, one in Toowoomba. Grew up in Queensland and um, yeah, we managed to convince our parents, that's myself and Duncan Toombs, yes. and we were both in the club, that it would be fine if we came down with one of the other families. Right. For our first time ever coming to Tamworth. So um, I still, you know, um, think that was very brave of our parents <laughs> to let us go for 10 days. Yeah. Um, but, At 13. Yeah. But we were well looked after. And that was yeah. your initiation into country music? Well, my initiation would have been the actual country music clubs, clubs. themselves. And the reason I got into country was because... I'd always sung music around the house. I'd always been making music. And then when I got a guitar, I started writing songs. Right. And my mum, she knew I needed to do something to share it and was trying to find an appropriate outlet, I guess, for a around 11, 12-year-old. Yes. Um, there's not a lot out there that is appropriate. And country music's very family-friendly. Yeah. And at the time, especially in Queensland, country music clubs were huge you know they were going very strong very big memberships and um so we went along and discovered it was awesome and I got up with my nylon string guitar with no pickup and they put a mic in front of it and I sang me and little Andy right so you um, remember it that well oh yeah <laughs> I practiced a lot <laughs> <laughs> and we still do right yeah that's yes. true yeah. So what keeps you in country? Because I know that you've you've tried a lot of different genres and you're in and out lots of different genres. So it's not it's not like you've just stuck in one, but what keeps you here in this particular spot coming back every year? I think what it's What is that country music that you love? I just think it's the relationships that we have um, musically and emotionally with people. Um, the audience is great. 
but no offence, oh, it's not really about The audience them. is great. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They won't, they'll boo me in a minute, but yeah. it's not really about you. I'm sorry. <laughs> the reason I keep coming back is because of my love of music and my mates and my friends and just collaboration, being able to watch something come from, I guess, 2D to 3D uh, once you go into the studio, whatever that yeah. is, yeah. live, working with a band, harmony. Uh, it's just something very special about that and incredibly rewarding. And I am, I guess, I do get itchy feet. I like to tr try new things and I've always been quite eclectic. So that's why I'm in different, you know, versions of myself. I have Bennett Botel and Urquhart yes. and my own solo work because I think that's, that's good for me too. It keeps me on my toes working with KB and Fliss. Yes. They're incredibly, incredibly good at what they do. So I have to make sure I'm up to standard, up to scratch. I so. like David and I, when you work with somebody else who you're in that team, because if you're co-writing with someone, you can say, oh, that's lovely, and then when you're out of the room, you can go fix it, right? <laughs> that's right. But when you're working in a group or duo or, or situation, you have to kind of build a bridge. It's taught me a lot about, yeah. um, because our times together are limited. Yes. We, we have very busy schedules. KB's in about 17 other bands. Kevin Bennett. And uh, I don't think I'm exaggerating. I think that's about right. Um, and then Fliss has a family, a beautiful family. She does Saturday Night Country. Yes. Anyone who saw the first podcast would realise just how much she takes yes. on. Um, yes. So she's incredibly busy and I'm incredibly busy. So when the three of us can align time together, it has to be quality over quantity. Yes. So we don't have time to faff around. Yes. We have to be real. So I'd like to... Uh start very early on in this interview by hearing a career highlight that was something amazing like what what's your biggest wow moment or moments give us a couple if you can't decide on one so my own personal like, personal yeah okay and it doesn't have to be the you know golden guitar stage it can be something whatever it is that touches your heart that you yeah. go that's that's the highlight for me well i'd have to say um see i i first saw star maker that first year and I remember watching Becky Cole win and it was just so awesome because it was a chick playing guitar. Yeah. And she played a solo and she looked like Dolly Parton and I had no idea she loved Dolly as well because I was just, you know, infatuated with Dolly. Um, and I just thought she was amazing. And I remember Duncan was going for a boy because that's how you are when you're 13. And I was like, nah, that girl's going to win. He's like, no, no, she's not going to win. And ironically... Because you're not a girl guitarist. Oh, no, Duncan's a guitarist, guitar, right? Back then it was very male oriented. It still is, you yes. know, guitar playing. Yes. So, um, and uh, I remember firmly when she won. And that, that made me go, I can do that. And I've heard that a lot about people who go on to Instamaker. They watch someone else doing it and they go, oh, I want to do that. Yes. And um, there was something incredibly real and funny and all that stuff. And even back then she hadn't really come out of that shell of just showing off how funny she was and incredibly quick witted and all the rest of it. But she was just always so dazzling for me. So yeah. that, I know it's not my career, but that was a very big highlight for me. And it, it made me want to proceed as a, as a female singer songwriter yeah. who played guitar. Yeah. So, and I remember she played Bush Lane Boogie and she had a oh. lead break in it. It's pretty wow. impressive. Um, and she wore this incredible foofy dress, which she hated. <laughs> but I thought it was great. <laughs> um, and so fast forward to when I was 18, I entered Star Maker. No, sorry, 17. I entered Star Maker and I didn't get through. I did a pretty bad demo. Um, remember, you know, my brother tried to help and he right. was no recording engineer. But that's okay. And the song wasn't also, also that Good. But um, then by the time I turned 18, I got in and I watched Darren Coggan win. We got through to the yeah, right. grand final together. and Another A lot of inspiration right he there. He's incredibly inspiring. Yeah. And then by the time I was 19, my third attempt, I guess, and second time through to the final, I won it. And that just, wow. I was just... And there's even a photo of me going... <laughs> <laughs> Because I did not expect to win that. And, and in the, back in the day, uh, radio was king. Yes. Very much. And people would sit at home and listen to Star Maker and listen for who would win. And they'd stay up all night listening to Hoedown. And Nick Irby would be the, um, 
the MC and, you know, it was a, it was a pretty big couple of days in mm. the town hall. Mm. Um, so that was a pretty inspiring moment. It made me realise that, um, wow, I, I can make a career of this with my own songs because up until that point I'd just been doing covers and, you know, just having yes. a bit of fun and not really brave enough to take it seriously. So um, that was incredibly huge. That was huge. I'd have to say... Another very special moment was when we were recording the Bella album. That's myself, Karen O'Shea and Kate Ballantyne. Yes. We had a record deal with BMG uh, in 2004. I think it was 2004. Um, I had a song called Gravity uh, on, and that was the title track of the album. And um, the Sydney Simph played. Oh, yeah. And I was sitting there on the ground in the recording studio just openly crying my melody was being played by the Sydney Symphony Orchestra and I just, you know, it's a pretty amazing moment yes. for me. Yeah. Um, and there's been a lot of amazing moments, but those two really stick out. Stand out. Mm. So along the roller coaster, which is life, but also when you're a musician, I think the roller coaster or anything artistic, the roller coaster seems to have some steeper curves um, in terms of career. Yes. And amongst that in the career, because I really do think that people, if they were a plumber and they had some of the ups and downs that we have as musicians, they'd go be an electrician, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But we tend to have this tenacity to stick at it. Um, but as well as that with the music, this is life as well. So what has been your biggest frustration in this 20 odd years of having a music career? And going through all those different iterations and, and being different versions of yourself in these different places. What, what's the biggest frustration for you? Uh, to be honest? Yeah, I want um, yeah, Yes, honest. <laughs> being a big girl. Right. Being a big girl in the industry. Because um, anyone who struggles with weight, I, you know, I, I have a few friends who do as well, and we talk about how you have to be the funniest yes the smartest or the best to be taken seriously because you might and it sounds you know it might sound a little um self-deprecating but it's just the truth sometimes yeah. you walk into a room and you're judged purely on your size and if people don't know you um they make a decision about you and that's life that's what yes. we do all the time i mean that's how we're actually um, I guess wired, hardwired to make judgment calls very quickly for survival we like reasons. To box people, don't we? Yeah, we go. You know, okay, I've got to be careful of that. That's okay. This yep. is okay. Yep. That's not. And when you walk into a room as a big person, I, I find it a lot at, at um, functions, industry things. Found it a lot during the Voice. They don't know me from Adam. They make a decision about me, and I'm like, that's cool. Just give me five minutes. Has that got better in the last decade? No. Um, because looking on from my perspective, it seems like it might have got better. I just know more people and they already respect or don't respect. They've made their decision. Right. Um, and they know me what to expect or they whatever, right? Yeah. But I feel that nothing, that doesn't change. That element mm. doesn't change. And there's also a, an element of uh, it's just Linny, you know, because I don't, I don't walk into a room in a miniskirt and I tell you what, if I could, I bloody would. <laughs> right? Like, I have skinny girlfriends, and when we go shopping, I dress them like tarts. <laughs> like, what are you doing? I'm not wearing this. We had just a small diversion. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> On our show yesterday, our Carter and Carter music show, we had Caitlin Thomas, 18, gorgeous. Curvy, beautiful, uh, mini skirt, oh, not mini skirt, but you know, short skirt. I had a short skirt on too. We had both had our flats because we didn't want to ruin the floor. And, and I said to Vanessa, um, our friend, I said, oh my goodness, look at her difference in her legs. Because, you know, here's Caitlin, beautiful, everything's perfect on her legs. And I'm thinking, is my dress long enough to get over my <laughs> knees, you know? And Vanessa just said to me, she goes, they're exactly the same. Yours just have more mileage. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Do you think as a woman, being a bigger woman, is that harder than if you were a bigger man? Yep. I agree. Uh, I think um, everything... There's ageism as well yes. for women. Yes, I yes the mileage. The mileage thing, <laughs> I think. Uh, all you have to do is watch the news. Watch the, watch the news and you'll see that most of the time, the women are younger than the men. Yes. You can't have an older woman 
And they feel um, like they have to have Botox on, don't they? So they, they talk like yeah, this because yeah. they can't they have lines. Well, and I, I mean, that's just how it is. And, and you can sit there and wallow in it and get really upset about it. Um, but that has been my biggest frustration. And yes, I try to rise above that. that as much as I can. Mm. But it has also made me incredibly people-pleasing. I have, a, I have a, a habit of doing that because I just I just want people to accept me. So it's it's so that becomes that fight, that internal fight mm. to be assertive mm. and say, no, I actually, or hey, I don't want to do that for you. Actually, yeah. I, I feel like looking after myself right now. Yeah. You know? Do you think that um, weight has been the issue for you? Perhaps. Do you think that for other people we all have an issue? Yeah, everyone does. Yeah. So it's hard to kind of. Because <clears throat> weight never affects me. I, I've got to say, I didn't even know Barack Obama was black. I didn't even see that until Dave said, oh, wow, the, America's first black president. And I went, what? <laughs> you black? Are you serious? A total. Serious, right? Because I don't see that kind of yeah. stuff. And Dave had to go, look, look. I go, oh, yeah. So, so in your is. eyes, I'm a size eight. Oh, oh, you're, you're just you. <laughs> you're just you. And I, but I, for myself... I feel those things. Yeah. You know, I feel, you know, I'm, I'm going to Dave, are you getting my good angle? You know, <laughs> because we do worry. But why do we worry? Because you know what? We are only really interested in the heart. Yeah. When the people who aren't interested in your heart aren't the people we want around us, are they? But yeah. in the industry, whatever industry we're in, there's kind of that pressure, isn't there, always? Well, there always is. I mean, a lot of it... Um we actually feed as women. Yes. You know, did you see she didn't look very good today? <laughs> really let herself down. Shame on us. Why was she wearing that? I don't know. You know, there's yeah. a lot of that that happens yeah. um, because we're all trying to keep a certain standard. Um, it was really funny. We went off early in the morning a couple of days ago for interviews. That's festival time. Yes. And I remember thinking. Yes, I started rather early this morning. As I was up curling my hair and sticking on my fa fake eyelashes and you know trying to st you know just get one more bit of coffee in before I slap <laughs> this stuff on um I thought you know what KB be doing right now sleeping yes and he's gonna roll out of bed half an hour before he has to leave yep, he's gonna go. have a quick shazza done whack on a fresh shirt yep. pull his hair back and he's done he just walks out the door and I thought maybe um, a fresh shirt Maybe a fresh shirt. Oh, no, he would always put a fresh shirt. Right. Some of the and boys don't even need to worry about that. Really. No, that's true. <laughs> but, um, oh, he can wear the same fresh shirt. Right, the yeah. same oh, fresh yeah. shirt that like, he had on yesterday. Fresh yeah, shirt. Right. Well, yeah, as long as it's clean. <laughs> um, but yeah. it's, it's a strange conundrum because I actually do really enjoy, it's kind of like a coat of armour a little bit. It helps me prepare because the person I am when I go shopping at Woolies is not this person. You know, and sometimes the two collide and I go shopping at Woolies dressed like this person and I feel really weird. And then I go shopping at Woolies in my, you know, Tracky -dats. tracks and um, someone comes up and goes, Lynn, it's so good to see you. I saw your gig and I'm like, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so embarrassed. You know what I do when that, that happens to me? I go, oh. You've caught me looking just normal today. Mm. Uh, you know, if, if when I'm a geek, I'm, I'm glam them, right? Do I, how do I match today? And they have a laugh and, and you know. Yeah. yeah. Because we're just normal people like everybody else. And they're normal people too. They're not that's as dressed true. up as when they come to no, a gig either. No, that's right. Might have caught them in their sneakers as well. But it's kind of yeah. a strange thing if I'm ever at a beautician or whatever it is, you know, pedicure and all that jazz, and they say, what do you do? I never like to say what I do. I don't. I just want to be... A person getting a pedicure, I don't want to talk about any of right. that stuff. I just right. like to turn it off sometimes yeah. okay. for sanity's sake. Right. Hmm. So you went on The Voice? Yeah. The year before last. Now? Yeah. Or the that's... year before the year before last? A couple of years ago. <laughs> <laughs> tell, us, uh, tell us a little bit about why you did that, because you're an established artist. You've got a, a well-known career. You've won six gold guitars. You've got all these albums. Why? Well, at the time... Um, I'd won three golden guitars actually at the time right. and I wanted to challenge for a start and I'd never, I had thought about it in, you know, cooking dinner, watching it when it was on or whatever and it had crossed my mind, geez, what would I do? Geez, what would I sing? How would that be? Oh, <laughs> keep cooking dinner. And, um, and then I was approached by Hayley from the voice team. She said, I see you're out of contract. 
that's what happened. I was out oh, of... Woohoo! Any... That's yeah. a great way to start the conversation. Well, it was basically they can't <laughs> approach you while you're in, yeah. in a contract. They can't for, right. for obligational reasons. You can't yeah. be doing two things because if you turn a chair or if you yes. win, yes. they have the first option to sign you. Yes. And if you're already signed to a label or yeah. you have distribution to a label or anything like that, mm. it, it doesn't work. So it doesn't matter if they want you, they can't have you. So Hayley approached me and she'd said that she saw me sing at Gympie Master. I got up and sang with Drew McAllister. And I was, um, I guess at that point, um, I was quite ill with, with endometriosis. And it made me really, um, I guess, I, I had this sense of freedom singing. Because I was just so sick most of the time that when I performed, it was just like, oh, just breaking free. And it opened up another little part of myself just when I thought I couldn't learn anymore you know like you know what I mean like you yeah, think yeah, you get a little bit stuck the, the zone where you could leave everything yeah. else behind and I, I remember time. shaking I remember holding the microphone and shaking from the adrenaline the feeling right. of just ah, oh, just letting loose and singing and it was that performance that made Hayley re reminded her that I existed again she always knew I did but she just checked to see where I was at in my career and so yeah. she contacted me and um, my initial thought was, really? Would I, I don't know. And then I went away and thought about it and discussed it with Damon, my partner and my manager and um, someone who I trust very much to have a very logical view on these things. I can get quite, um, I guess, attached to ideas and notions. Right. And I need that grounding to just say, well, these are the pros and cons, you know. Yeah. Um, so we looked at the pros and cons and I thought, Oh, stuff it. You know, there's, I think there was 2 million people watching for most of the blind auditions. Right. Um, and I thought, if someone said, Lynn, would you like to do a gig in front of 2 million people? You go, yeah. I go, yeah, I think I'll give that a go. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's why we did it initially. Yeah. And um, there was a lot of rigmarole involved. Like, yeah. There was a lot of time consumed with discussing you know, because I wasn't going to just sign everything they put in front of me. Yeah. So, um, and I was very lucky again to have Damon there because he was that rock. That person said, you don't need this. We can say no. Yeah. It's okay to say no. Yeah. So um, I guess that really helped me to go, yeah, I'm free to do whatever the heck I want. Just I don't do have to do rather this. Rather than be so attached to the outcome. Would that That's be right? That's right. And yeah. a lot I noticed just from the outside, no, I don't have any real... <sighs> you know, proof or uh, total understanding of this, but watching other younger contestants or even, even older ones going through it, they had said yes to everything and thrown everything on the line. Yes. And I was really pleased Especially I didn't do that. Especially in the early that. days. I think that's got a bit tempered now because mm. there's we've seen the outcomes of some of those early decisions. It, you know what? It, yeah. it, it is true. You know, you've been there and you've once beaten, twice shown, you go, I remember what that was like. Yeah. Blew, not doing that again. Yeah, yeah. I'm not signing a six album deal, yeah. you know. Yep. So, um, and I can't get into too much of that, but basically we just um, bartered for what we wanted right. and we were always prepared to walk away. And it was right up until the January of, was it the year before last, I think, yeah, that I was still doing contractual things right. before the actual filming started. Oh, right. Mm. Okay. And given that you've just identified self-image as being one of the things that you've struggled with, how, how was that? Well, um, everyone knows that uh, any of these reality TV shows are about a backstory. Yes. And I knew from the get-go I did not want to do the fat girl story. Uh, it was a number one thing. I'm like, I'm not going to be the big girl who hasn't, you know, made it huge yet. I, I, I was going to not, because that's the thing. You have to learn how to control what you give them. If Whatever you give them, they can use. Yes. So I was very aware of that. Um, and so I discussed it with um, some previous uh, contestants on right. The Voice. Yep. I actually talked to them and said, what was this like? What was that like? Yeah. Um, so a lot of preparation there to get your mind around well, it. Well, for me, it, it, as you say, you're an established artist. Why yeah. would you do this? Yeah. And, it, and it, um, there's only so much you can control. Yes. So I knew that um, it was important that what I had control over, I had preparation for. Yes. Yeah, so I, um, I wanted to talk about my dad and honour his memory. And I talked to mum and I said, what do you think? And she's like, oh, I think it'd be wonderful if all of Australia got to see pictures of your father. Yeah, nice. So I was like, all right, yeah. sounds like a plan, mum. 
So um, that's the angle I went with because he meant so much to me and to my entire family and musically meant a lot. So yes. we went with that angle because I, I didn't want it to be too sobby. You know, there's a yeah. lot of sob stories. Yes. Um, so I wanted it to be about honouring his memory. Though, of course, I was up for five golden guitars that year that january that helps so they did a big story about that yep. they even called me the queen of country music which i thought was hilarious because that's gina jeffries or gene stafford so um when they called me that uh, i remember sonia kruger said that <laughs> as i walked i'm like uh <laughs> princess you could have gone with princess well maybe or significant other but yeah. um, <laughs> not the queen <laughs> it was hilarious uh, and so was it a because you didn't get right through, but you had some great um, yeah, exposure. I, I and was it worthwhile? Did you come out feeling positive from it? Or did you like... Not at first, to be honest. Right, at at yeah. the end of it all, I was like, gosh, that was a lot of buggering around, wasn't it? Yeah. And um, I really wanted to go to the lives. I really wanted that opportunity. But what yeah. I've come to understand afterwards is I was never going to go to the lives for a few reasons. And I think, um, uh, you know, the fact that we had whittled that contract down to being so in my favour. The minute you go to lives, Australia has a choice. So then I get to choose, you know what I mean? Yes. There's a, I think that yes. would be a big factor in it. Yeah. Um, and and also I'm not a in, tiny shiny. So, yeah. so yeah. they must be going in with something particular in their mind. And even so. though they wouldn't necessarily identify with that straight up. Oh, God, no. They were very good, though. I've got to say they were very um, caring about you know, they, they took a lot of time with what you did rehearsal-wise. Like, I got bored. I was like, oh, my God, if I have to sing this again. You know, I know where I'm standing, people. You know, but, you know, so way, in like, hindsight, it took a lot of nerves. Once those cameras were rolling and the audience right. were there, that was pretty, like, vomit world, you know. So you were bored thinking. because you were, they were over-rehearsing. Yes, And because yes. you were an established artist. Yes, I was like, oh, I got, I got this. this. Yeah, but right. you know what, they knew better because yeah. once it was rolling, it doesn't right. matter how established you are, Wow, the nerves are right up here. Right. So um, it was. It she was did not look nervous, did she? No, that's the years oh. of experience. I think, and stepping yeah, in there, I guess. Yeah, yeah and, and I was highly medicated. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I really was. I was highly medicated, man. The um, I had a cyst that had ruptured, and it was pretty painful. Yeah. So um, there was a fair bit of codeine involved in my calm yeah. nerves. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Well, lucky it wasn't me on codeine. I hit the roof and I have anything with Ian on the end. Oh, do you? Oh, yeah, I'm like chlorine. chlorine oh, you're the ceiling. opposite. Yeah, yeah. So for Nergen, you'd be like... Oh, no, it's got to have the Ian. You know, oh, the Ian. Pseudo Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My ones. brother's like... Nah. <laughs> and I don't need that. No. So I want to move on um, to health issues because you've mentioned it a few times yep. and I know from knowing you personally. But, you know, often it's not obvious as an audience just what you were struggling through. And you were saying, you know, we laugh, we can laugh now with oh, you. Oh, absolutely. That you were highly medicated. But I bet at the time that was pretty hard. Every step hurt at yeah. the time. Yeah. Um, and Fox Studios is huge. And you're always, you know, dragging your instrument and following someone walking incredibly fast yeah. to get you so to this studio. So even if you're physically healthy, it's quite demanding yes, and challenging. Yeah, yeah hurry up and wait. Health. Hurry up and wait. Yes. A little bit of that going on. Um, so um, I was diagnosed with endometriosis when I was about... I think I was about 16 and I'd been diagnosed with polycystic ovary syndrome around the age of 13 from memory 14 maybe wow. 15. That's um, quite early for a diagnosis isn't it? Yeah so yeah. I'd had a lot lots of women of, don't find out till their late teens early 20s. Well I had lots of problems early on and um, so puberty yeah so I was 11 you. when all that started right so um yeah, it was really painful and um, would require, you know, a week away from school. Right. So my mum started looking into it. She's a pretty proactive woman. Um, so she started looking into it pretty quickly. And I'm a social butterfly. I love my friends. So me wanting to stay home from school was very strange. Right. So, um, yeah, I was in a lot of pain. And they diagnosed PCOS. They knew a fair bit about that. That's polycystic ovaries. Yes. Um, and Quite I had the syndrome as well. Yes, women. that's yeah. right. So it's when um, the eggs don't, you know, when you form an egg, it forms a cyst. It doesn't go down the fallopian tube yep. um, and all that sort of jazz. And, and you can have multiple, multiple cysts. Yeah, that's In the fact, poly. That's the, yeah. So you have all these cysts. Yep. So um, that's all they diagnosed at first. They didn't know I had endo. 
because they don't they still are learning about endometriosis it's still quite an unknown quantity um i'm not really sure that in my lifetime they'll they'll figure it out i'm not really sure i think it'll take a lot, lot longer mm. but is that because it's different in every woman or is it a money issue for funding for i think it's because it's only just getting noticed it's only just starting to get noticed because women suffered. My mum must have had it. They said she had fibroids and they gave her a hysterectomy at 30-something. Yeah, I think right. she was early 30s and she had a hysterectomy. So she was probably <coughs> suffering from endometriosis as well. That's right. But it wasn't identified then. No, they called them fibroids. They didn't know what that was really. Right. Just clean that up, get rid of that. Yeah. And they've since understood that um, hysterectomy doesn't actually cure it. Uh, having a baby doesn't cure it. There's all these myths out there. You can't catch it from anyone. Um, it's incredibly painful and, and um, sorry if I'm being too graphic, but periods should not be really painful. Yeah. They just shouldn't. No. And um, it can grow anywhere. It can grow on your brain. It can grow on your lung. It can grow on your Is finger. that right? Because we always associate it. Well, I've always with the associated uterus and all that sort yeah, of stuff. With no, it can, it can grow in the urethra. Right. Um, Men? So, no, it's a female problem. It's definitely a female thing. Yeah. So it's a hormone-related thing? Yeah. Do you think if it grow the, the brain, maybe a man could get it? Because it's not just about... But it's to do with estrogen and, and, right. and that whole cycle that happens. Right. Something's skew with there. Right. There's this wrong information going on. So basically, the lining of the uterus grows in the wrong place. Right. So where it grows, it also sheds. So, oh, yeah, I have a pretty wow. painful spot just here. And yep. I don't think I'm going to do anything about it because... You know, as long as I can keep that that cycle from happening, I'm okay. Yes. So a lot of women who are young and trying to have kids, they have a terrible time when they ha when they suffer it. But yeah. so basically, I'd kept it at bay for many years, um, staying on on a constant pill um, yes. and never going off it, um, and that helped my PCOS as well. So it was kind. Of, it took quite a few years to work all that out. I think yeah. I was in my mid twenties by the time we worked Plus, it all out. Plus, you know, as women, we take a long time to do fill up all those patterns in their bodies as well. and then true. they change we just get no, used no. to them and whammo it's changed again well <laughs> and so i got all that under control and i yeah. was i was pretty good like i had a few stabby pains but here and there but whatever you know and um and then i just had a gp say you probably should have a break because you've been on the pill since you were 14 15 yeah. you should probably take three months off every now and again which was because of the risk of breast cancer, which I've now understood was false information. Because unless there's a history of breast cancer in your family, right. it's kind of like if there's no history, then the percentage chance of you actually having breast cancer is incredibly low. You know, so it just increases if there's a history and all that sort of stuff. Right. Um, so it's no different than some of the other hormone treatments that people generally have, yes. thyroid and those yeah. kind of things. Yeah. So I went off it for two <clears throat> months and grew a seven. 0.4 centimetre cyst, I think it was, on my right ovary. It was bigger than my ovary. Well done. That was Thank you. quite quick work. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I thought it was impressive too. Yes. <laughs> and I was actually in a band rehearsal for um, Southern Steel for our first ever Tamworth show, you know, getting together and having our last Sunday drinks kind of vibe yeah. gig. And I was like, ooh, ooh, that's not good, is it? And um, I'd been to the doctor earlier in the day and she said, oh, you could have an ectopic pregnancy, but... Um, Let's just see. I'll give you an ultrasound tomorrow because I think it was a Sunday or something. Right. And which I've since found out that was bad too. I should have gone straight to the hospital. But anywho, um, so I'm going. I'm sitting on a. I'm sitting on an amp going. E oh ah oh. And Duncan's like, Linny, what's going on? I'm like, oh, could be an ectopic pregnancy. He's like, what the hell are you doing in bed? <laughs> <laughs> Tamer was out pacing because he was quite stressed. And he was your stressed. partner at the time, right? No, no. Oh, no, this was after this. This was, this was so Duncan was um, playing in the band for Southern Steel. Right. It was only three years ago, I think. Is that right? Right, right, right. And um, he was in my first band. Yes, I would Rewind 20-something yes, years back. Yes, And you were a couple and so for we, a long time. Many years. And yeah. so we decided to get, for nostalgia reasons and just for fun, that we'd get together the last Sunday of the Tamworth Festival and have a bit of a jam right. and all these people showed up we're like we probably should do that again so we're in yeah, our right. third year but this right. was our first rehearsal for it right so oh, i was just thinking my... when he's like what the hell are you doing at rehearsal if if he was possibly the father there was probably oh no 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 on. no it was right, more no. that he just um he has two kids of his own yes, and, and yes. he understands yes. you know yeah and and i remember damon was pacing a lot smoking probably going i don't know that she's well enough for this yeah and um because he was the one who could possibly be the father yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> so he was dealing quite Can well. Can go around? Yeah, and I'm just sitting there singing something, I can't remember what, thinking, I think I need to go to the hospital. Yeah. 
And so we, we get in the car and we drive to the hospital and, and yeah, found out I had this massive cyst. Right. And then they didn't want to touch it. And so by January, I was sitting watching Star Maker on the ground. And I remember Damon pacing quite a lot these few months and just watching me like a hawk because I kind of, I think I'd change when bad stuff was about to happen. And I went to stand up and the cyst ruptured. So um, I spent a lot of time at Tamworth Hospital. Yeah. And I remember there was a quote... <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think the Herald or something, that out of all the hospitals I'd been to, this was one of the best <laughs> at Tamworth. And I meant that. It was lovely. The staff were nice. And Great. I spent a week there after festival. I spent a couple Great. of nights in Great. hospital between gigs. Yeah. Um, so it was pretty rough. And the endometrioma it was an endometrioma. And, right. and those cells fell. Yes. And fast forward to, you know, April at The Voice, they were growing quite fast and causing a lot of pain. Hmm. And these are the things when we hear of artists. Uh, uh, recently, Pink was touring last year. Yes, and had to had to cancel. She was fatigued, overly and, big and time. I hear, and and I know you guys are not like that because I know a lot of you personally, and I know that you are genuine people. But the carry on about Pink, how dare she cancel my concert tickets? And you know, the poor woman was exhausted in hospital. And I bring it back to we're just normal people. And I don't care if you've paid $200 for your ticket, you will get a refund. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and you will get to go again. But Pink and, and other artists, when you're unwell, you might not get another chance. That's, because that's if it. you don't look after yourself, it could be the end of your career. I remember they took shots of her lying on the beach. I think she was at Byron Bay or Bondi. I don't know. And I remember someone gave her some stick about the fact she was yeah. just laying around. It was like well, she was probably trying to get better, having a rest. And she had to actually come out and write something to explain herself and in yeah. no other f business we, we don't get sick pay no. unless you're insured for that no um and you know if i don't show up to my gig i don't make yeah. that money and i remember saying to someone who was complaining to me about it i said health issues aside and let's you know she's a mum and she's on tour she's on display the whole time you know she must be really sick to cancel to start yes. with but then think about the millions of that dollars she was going to lose and That's the right. hundreds and hundreds of people who were out of work that day you know you don't do these things lightly no but at our level it's a it's a different kettle of fish luckily most people understand but it, it's it's hard isn't it, it to just get up some days and and get going but it's a real lesson for life generally yeah I, I i learned a lot about how resilient i was the yeah. last two years because um I joked that I was heavily medicated, but I couldn't actually take that much. There were nerve blockers I would have to take for the yeah. nerve pain and things yeah. like that. And things affect our voice too. Yes, so I couldn't have them when I was Just singing. Me, she clears her throat. <coughs> oh, it's, you know. Yes. When I was singing, if it's I had a lot of that, uh, I, my singing was really floppy for want of a better explanation. Right, right. So I'd go to sing and a little... What the heck? Right. You know, um, things would happen. Mine catches, or I feel like I dry it out. So yeah, you well, go the codeine's very dry. You go for the vote note, and then suddenly you're going, ah, and the vote note's gone out there. Yeah. yeah. So I just had to take um, some Panadol and things during shooting, and then yeah. of an evening I'd just fall in a heap and mm. take mm. a bunch of pills. But um, so it was quite, um, yeah, it was revealing how far I'd go for my music. Yeah. Because I could yeah. have walked away. Yes. I didn't have to do yes, it. Yes, you obviously loved it. But I, I really wanted to. Because you could get a job and have sick leave. Yeah, I know, I could. And get paid yeah. for that. I won't go. read something from your website okay because uh you and i could sit here and talk forever yes because uh, we've done that yes <laughs> we do that but i i really wanted to i in researching even though i know you reasonably well and you and i have worked on songwriting camps recently and had heart to hearts at midnight around the yeah. table with vanessa over yes absolutely um I wanted to go and just do some, you know, more career kind of investigating about you to make sure I had my facts right. Yeah. And I came across a Christmas gift on the front page of your music website. And uh, I found it to be a very revealing 
vulnerable, honest appraisal of yourself. Mm. And I want to, I'm going to talk to you about this for the <laughs> last uh, 10 minutes we have because given particularly that I know that the people pleasing is something that you've identified prior to today, mm. you and I have had this discussion, and so many of us who are a little bit in the spotlight, um, I guess there's an extra dimension of people pleasing because you know you said earlier it's not about the audience but it is still we want the audience oh, yeah. to love what we, want we do this. and yeah if you and don't please them they don't give you that yeah so, and and you want yeah. them to come and you want to make yeah. sure they're happy and yeah. comfortable and and everything so i i found this really revealing and really refreshing and courageous Thank you. and i just like to delve into a few of the just a little bit deeper if we if you're game mm -hmm. Here's a quote. So it's on the front page of Linny's website. If you haven't been there, go have a look before Christmas has passed and you take it down <laughs> or archive it. But uh, you gave us a little Christmas message, which was lovely, a little blessing for Christmas. And then this. When I read this to Dave, he was like, yeah, that's lovely. She's, she's you know, lovely message. And then he goes, whoa. Here we are after Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Linny's quote, I am prone to hurting myself, both physically and emotionally. Once I've decided on an action, I dive in feet first, fearlessly. This has both been both a saving grace and a contributing factor in many of my most miserable moments. Let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. What do you want to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> firstly, firstly, courage. What made you put that up? Because nowhere else on your website, we've got all the usual... I'm in a bit of the voice, I've done this, gone guitars, everything, all the things that we do. Then you've got this smack bang on your front page, revealing beautiful well, I, story. I started writing stories, oh, it must be four years ago now. Just every now and again I'd write yep. a story. and um, Not like this. This one's the most revealing. Yeah. Uh, I'd been working on it. I started writing it maybe 12 months ago, right. actually. It yep. was... Um, and... And basically, this story goes on to explain that I was at a carols, and um, we do this carols every year at Tillagree in, uh, in Newcastle area. And I was meant to sing on Silent Night. Yes. And I didn't know Gina was doing it first in her set. And, I, and so we introduce each other, so I fini finish, we finish our bit, and I'm like, and now, ladies and gentlemen, Gina Jeffries. And so I walk off the stage, and... I'm going around the back, I'm like, oh, I'm going to have a drink. And then I'm hearing the start of Silent Night. And I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> so I just run. But the thing is, I'd only just have had an operation three weeks earlier for uh, removing the endometriosis. Right. So I was still incredibly sore. Yeah, and probably shouldn't be running. Uh, no. <laughs> probably shouldn't have been Doing directing gig. that event either. Yeah. But um, we have to do what we have to do. So I just forget myself and just run around the side of the stage and uh, I trip on the cable cover, which is there to stop people tripping, ironically. Um, <laughs> and I trip and fall. No fault of the crew is what you're saying. No, here. that's right. It wasn't their fault. No. And I trip and, and fall just at the, at the steps. And I'm like, oh, dear. Hmm, that, that's popped something, hasn't it? Oh, that's good. And I stand up and I look and all my mates are backstage going, <laughs> watching me and I'm thinking oh well I can't have that so I, I just pretend I'm Mag Magda Sabansky who yep. I love so much I'm like <laughs> I'm good and then I'm I'm right. like, Yay! <laughs> you know and I go up on stage and sing Silent Night and yep. then a couple of hours later I'm vomiting from pain and yep. in a really bad way yep. sitting in the car just hiding and uh, so that was the I guess the example of hurting myself physically and yes. emotionally because what yep. I actually needed was my mates to come up and get me? Yep. Have me sit down. Whisper to Gina. We'll have to do that give later me a in stiff the set. Scotch. Yeah. Or, or you're on your own, love. Oh, good luck with that. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm sure Rod yep. can sing the third part. You know, yeah. I, I just should have done that, but I didn't because um, of what I've been trained to do. I guess the show must go on, and I've always been trained to. I've trained myself. It's it, it's just inbuilt, you know. Yeah. To do that, and and that resilience is really, really important. Yeah. It's about getting that balance, though, isn't it? That's right. When it's just re resilience, I think it would have been okay. Stupidity. <laughs> That's right. I think in that moment it would have been okay yeah. to go. You know what? Yeah. Mm, yeah. You're okay out there, Gina. You look amazed. Balls off you go, yeah. and and just sit down yeah. for a wee while. But I yeah. didn't do that, and 
I guess there's something about by the time you get into your early 40s, I'm 41 now, um, you know you're not old and you're not young, so you should know better, uh, you know, but you still want to have that, um, yeah. I guess, zest for life and you feel like mm. you should be able to take on the world. Yeah. But um, I think something's changed in me where I start to understand that it is okay to say no. It's just now actually putting that into practice. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'll read the next yeah, little bit. Yeah, because bit. you go on, which was great. And uh, you, you were talking, I think, about this, about learning. Yeah. And uh, you actually say at the end of this, I have so much to learn and much to unlearn, which is what you're referring to there. But this is what you go on to say in this beautiful story. Don't get me wrong. I am a bubbly, happy person. I am joyous and optimistic. But at times, I wish I could just relax and be me in the moment, not the me I think people prefer to see. This complaint I have about the world, about how the world views me at times is both a reflection of our society's attitudes towards imperfection, which I think is awesome, and my own complicity in it. The clown, the fool, the funny fat chick, all distractions from my perceived failings. I have so much to learn and so much to unlearn. What I'm seeing here, and this is what Ordinary Angels is about, is about opening ourselves to a different perspective. Hmm. It comes naturally for many women when we hit the 40s. Trust me, when you get to the big 5-0, it yeah. gets even better. Oh, and, and I'm told, I'm not sure if anyone's... There's a few lovely women here who are maybe in a bit older category, 6-0. And does it get even better? Yeah. yeah. You don't really give a rat's after a while. <laughs> I know my mum doesn't. She even says it. I don't give a rat's. She's like, that's it. That's what we're doing. I find myself being, being you know, in that, oh, my goodness, I've got to be professional. And then most of the time, what you see is what you get with me. Yeah. But sometimes I just go, whoops, there's the line. Uh-oh. I was on stage when I stepped over the line. As you get older, you really don't care as much. Yeah. Um, but the transition time, this is where you're at. And yeah. you know what? It's a really wonderful place to be because not every woman does go through that transition. Some people are into their 70s, 80s, 90s where they're still really so worried. And I think one of the lovely things is that to watch you developing, and not just as an artist as you grow into a more mature woman, but that you're having this new perspective. Yeah. So what, given that that's uh, a more recent experience for you than me, <laughs> what, what advice have you got for younger women, particularly in the music industry, but women in general, and particularly <gasps> those who perhaps don't fit the mould of what you think or they think society expects of them? Well, being that, you know, I work with academy students yeah. who are often quite young. Yes. From, you know, junior academy through to senior academy. Yes. Um, I, I think what I see most is that destructive nature that we have from uh, comparing ourselves to others. Yes. It's, it's quite destructive. So I guess what I'm saying is it's important to compare. It's important to go, hey, hang on, am I, am I doing the right thing here? Am I up to the right level? Like I was talking about with Fliss and KB when I work with them, that's healthy. Yes. And then there's that whole thing of... Well, that's rising. It's rising that's yourself right. to say, how can I be a better person? Yeah, but I think my advice would be um, instead of investing so much time on comparing yourselves to others on social media and how you look and... Um, trying to fit in, in in that way, I think you should compare yourself to how you were yesterday and the day before and are you improving on the things you really love? Are you feeding the right wolf? You know, are you... Uh, because I think that there's something to be said about investing in yourself and just making sure that if you love something, you're doing it. Yes. You know, that you're not actually surrounding it and you're not just uh, embracing all the the colour of it and not actually focusing on what truly matters. I guess what I'm trying to say is I think sometimes with, with my career in music where I look at myself, because it is my love and it is my passion, but I have to make sure that I don't just feed um, that social media side, that, that applause side, that I remember why I picked up that guitar and it spoke to me, mm. that I remember that I, I love music for its healing powers and for the fact that um, 
it just takes you away somewhere else. It's like watching a really great movie and you go into the movies and the lights dim and you, you wouldn't know if, if it was raining outside. Sometimes you go outside and it's dark and you went in and it was light and you think, oh, wow, that, yes, wow. <laughs> you know, that's how music is to me. It yeah. just, it takes me away for however long I'm involved in it. I have to make sure that I'm enjoying it because, um, and, and that's what I would say that I've come to understand. Um, is I see a lot of young women worrying about, you know, what they're wearing so much more than, than ever before. And that um, this social norm of, of hashtag living my best life, I mean, you know, um, all that Instagramming and hashtag filtering. Hashtag FOMO, fear, oh, of, missing fear of missing out. Horrific. Um, so I just think it'd, it'd be really nice if, if they engage more in their own self-love and, and that being what they truly enjoy in life and, and paying more attention to that and, and all the rest of that stuff will follow. And when people say things that aren't complimentary, as does happen, it won't matter so much. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely. We're going to have to wrap this up. Would I you could like talk to sing ages. it? Do we want a song? Yes. Yeah. We okay. want a song. We'd all love right. a song. I've been trying to work out what to sing for you. David's reminding me, I was trying to uh, skip over this because the time is a bit short, but he's saying that you're allowed to ask me one question, so I've asked you multiple questions. David behind the camera there. Thanks, honey. <laughs> Good work, Dave. So before you sing a song, do you, would you like to sing? I've, you know, picked your brain. I guess I would, I would just like to start with a statement. I think you're an incredible person. You have... <sighs> You talk about resilience in me, good God. You know, you just, um, you look a problem in the eye and go, all right, what angle am I gonna come at you? I'm not gonna, I'm sure there are moments when you don't feel that way, but generally speaking, that is who you are. You're the kind of person who thinks there's a, there's a way around this. I wanna know, how did you learn that? What taught you that? I would have to say farmer dad. Yeah. Uh, my parents lived their life in a very small circle and I live my life here and I realised that life is like even way, 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 way out there for me. But my dad was always one of those people, they were born depression babies. So their whole thing in life, if it's not working, we'll fix it. And if we don't know what's going to happen, we'll just wait and see. Mm -hmm. But if something, dad was one of those sort of people who, and he was in a practical sense, farmer, this job needs doing, I haven't got the money or someone here to help me, so how am I gonna make this work? So we'd go to the shed and he'd bang around and get this and get an old tin and cut this and glue this and staple that and whatever, and he would come up with a solution. So all I've done is taken that very practical thing, because I'm not, I'm not that person, yeah. but I am the person who goes, okay, well, all right, it's not a problem, we'll just make it work. It's incredibly Simple practical. as that. <laughs> Simple That's as amazing. that. amazing. Hmm. Thank you. That's good to know. Problem solver. Yeah. But then I try to tell David that I'm the ideas person <laughs> and uh, let him solve some problems, which he's very good at as well. So let's hear a song. Okay. Um, so Dave said I, sh I should sing something that's important to me. Yes, and I have. Please. Oh, you know what it's like. Every song's important. But if I could go back to when I started on, if we're talking about this journey of. I don't know, understanding about what you need and, and how, to, how to actually um, express that and also how that reflected in my music, it would have to be the song Beautiful Liar. So I wrote this in 2011 um, and it was, I think, the first time I'd been really, really honest in a song. So I'd always had a Disney ending before then it would always be like things were bad but hey everything worked out in the end every yep. song would you know there were no murder ballads not that I've written a murder <laughs> ballad either but if I'm co-writing and we can kill them off oh they're going right right I, I quite <laughs> I love to be dramatic like that and um I didn't understand just how difficult that could be that um being that real is is incredibly revealing um, and I wrote this as, a, as a, a letter to the person I was sending it to. Um, and then I looked at it and I thought, no, nah, they don't deserve a letter. That's a song. I'm just going to write a song. So, um, 
Yeah, so this song isn't necessarily, um, I don't know if it's it's perfectly written or anything, I'm not saying that. I just, I just think for me it's incredibly honest and um, it just kind of spilled out quite fast and then I... I looked back on it and tried not to mess with it too much. That was actually my end goal, was to just be really um, uh, brave to express the truth. So even though, though that was a while ago, it set me on a different path musically and I think it actually spurred on who I've become now because it was a big change in my life. Yeah. It was, I was going through a divorce and it was very messy and... Yeah. Um, it was very, very difficult to come out of the other side of that with a positive outlook, and I've always had one. So I think I had to write this song to to express it all, and it just helped me move forward. It's your therapy. Yeah. Yeah. It's a beautiful song. Mm. One of my favourites, actually, so I'm glad you picked that. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. This is Beautiful Liar. Such a conundrum So confusing So hurtful Baby So loving Been thinking of you lately how do we get to this place Where we don't talk we don't even argue and I don't see your face My heart was on fire I trembled with fear in the headlights I never could arrival The touch of your skin, no desire you 